journey to lost civilizations. See ancient artifacts and long lost ancient scrolls. The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. Now the script was used to take the journey of a lifetime and travel to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. A live seminar series. Don't miss any program. Good evening and welcome again to Ancient Mysteries Reveal the Future. We trust you enjoyed your day and we're looking forward to sharing this amazing program together tonight. But before we go into tonight's program, given that it's a special long weekend, the Easter weekend, we have a special offer that we'd like to make to all of you. If you go below the screen, you'll see the word card. And if you click on card and response number one is the offer we want to make this evening. I'd like a copy of the book Messiah. It's a tremendous book on the life of Jesus. Uh, something that I've valued, written in many languages, and you just thoroughly enjoy this uh, incredible book on the life of Jesus Christ, fitting in beautifully with our, our Easter weekend. Then, if you would like a summary of tonight's program, make sure you click on that right at the bottom underneath your screen on card. Go to the bottom. I want a summary. Make sure you get a summary of tonight's program because, of course, we're talking about uh, the Antichrist tonight, make sure you put your name and address and contact details so we can send you the resume and get you that book, Messiah. All right, so tonight, Antichrist, a topic that many, many people are interested in and want to know about. History's greatest hoax. A vital program tonight. We need to understand very clearly. So let's begin with prayer and ask God to help us. Father, tonight we thank you so much that we can open the Bible. Please help us to understand this topic. Give us clear minds and may we be willing to follow what your word says. Help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, many ideas of Antichrist uh, circulate today. I was reading the Bulletin magazine on the eve of the new millennium. And I noticed that some people said Henry Kissinger uh, was the Antichrist. Some said Prince Charles. Others said Bill Clinton back then. And of course, there was a magazine, uh, a newspaper doing the rounds of the country that I was in at the time and said, this guy with 666 tattered in his forehead, a Jewish man, Simon Lee. Well, many ideas about Antichrist. Who or what is Antichrist? One thing's for sure. If we want to know about Antichrist, we must go to the Bible because this is a Bible term. Hollywood, of course, has its version, but we want to go back to the real source, the Bible tonight. So who or what is Antichrist? First of all, we notice the meaning of Antichrist. Two words, Antichristos. Anti means against. So it's against Christ. It also means, obviously, opposed to Christ. And then in the place of Christ. These are the meanings. Let's understand the New Testament principles because you see the word Antichrist is only found in the book, the letters of John. Of course, he talks about the Antichrist under a different term in the book of Revelation. Paul talked about it, the man of sin. And so Antichrist is mentioned many times in terms of its, its, its story but only one place is the word Antichrist mentioned, and that's in the letters of John. He mentions the Antichrist, but the other books also pick up about this power. The New Testament principles. One, it's against Christ's followers. That's why it is Antichrist. You see, the Bible says in Revelation 13, it was granted to him to make war with the saints or God's friends and to overcome them. Now, you remember when Paul was on the road to Damascus to kill Christians, 
he was struck by that great light, which was Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, Saul wasn't persecuting Jesus himself per se, but he was persecuting the church. If you attack God's people or his church, you are against Christ, in other words. So, Antichrist against the followers of Christ. He's Antichrist because he's against Christ's laws. Paul talks about Antichrist, calls him the man of sin here. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day, that's the coming of Jesus Christ, it will not come before the rebellion occurs and the man of sin or the Antichrist is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. So notice it there, the man of sin, he calls him. Now, what's the man of sin or what is sin? We saw that what is sin? It is the transgression or the breaking of the law. We noticed that last weekend, the breaking of God's commandments. So sin is lawlessness or breaking God's laws. So therefore, whose laws do we actually break? Well, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The great lawgiver was Jesus Christ. He was the one who gave Moses the commandments on Mount Sinai. Paul says that rock that followed them where they got water from, so to speak, that rock was Christ. Christ was the lawgiver. So to be against the law which Christ gave is to be against Christ. Hence, Antichrist is opposed to the laws of Christ. Antichrist appears before Christ returns. That may surprise some people, but it's clearly what the Bible says. Paul speaking again, we'll go back to that passage in 2 Thessalonians 2. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day, he's talking about Christ's return, it will not come before the rebellion occurs. And the man of sin, that's his antichrist, is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. So you see, antichrist comes before Jesus' return. Number four, it had begun in New Testament times, begun in the days of the apostles. Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world, says John. In fact, Paul, talking about the man of sin or the Antichrist, he says, the mystery of lawlessness, that's Antichrist, is already at work. It's begun already, had started even in the days of the apostles. Number five, it has Christian origins. Many people think Antichrist is some future atheistic dictator or something, but no, the Bible says it actually has Christian origins. The Antichrist is coming, says John. Even now, many Antichrists have come. They went out from us, from among the Christians, he's saying. But they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued or remained with us. Now, when Paul came here to the city of Miletus to meet the elders of Ephesus, fascinating place to visit Miletus, but he came here. <coughs> and when he talked to the elders, he said these words. Also, from among yourselves, from among Christians, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. So here are the principles of Antichrist in the New Testament. Let's notice them, summarize them. One, he's Antichrist because he's against Christ's followers. He's Antichrist because he's against Christ's laws. He's Antichrist, he appears before Christ's return the second time. He had already begun in New Testament times and it has Christian origins. These are the principles of Antichrist in the New Testament. But all the references to Antichrist in the New Testament, they all draw from one book in the Old Testament, that of the prophet Daniel. That's where they're getting their information from and adding to it. So we need to go back to the book of Daniel tonight, to the seventh chapter. 
John sees four beasts coming up out of the briny ocean there in his book. These four beasts represent four kingdoms. We don't have to guess at that. The Bible interprets itself. Daniel is told the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. So here comes these beasts up out of the ocean and he's told each beast represents a kingdom. Now that shouldn't surprise us. We use the same idea even today. Imagine if you saw a picture, even a cartoon, where there was a kangaroo on one side of the table, a kiwi on the other, and up the end, an eagle. You would know that three powers are meeting. Of course, the kangaroo, the kiwi, New Zealand, the eagle, the United States, and of course, the kangaroo, the Aussies. These nations are meeting in a conference. We use that idea today. Well, the Bible did too. When the Bible talks about beasts or something, it's not trying to be nasty or, or pointing fingers. It's just simply using these as symbols of powers. That's the way the Bible used it. So the first beast that comes up out of the briny ocean is a lion with eagle's wings. This, of course, represented the great empire of Babylon. In fact, when you go to see the Ishtar Gates in the Pergamon Museum in Babylon, coming off from the Ishtar Gates is a processional way, and there, the processional ways has lions with eagles or wings on them. You notice here, this idea of a lion with wings is actually comes from ancient Babylon itself. And the Bible uses a lion with eagle wings to represent Babylon. The bear that came up next with three ribs in its mouth, it came up one side was higher than the other. Of course, this is the kingdom of Medo-Persia. It was a dual empire. First of all, the Medes were the strongest and then the Persians became the superior power of that dual empire. The three ribs, the three nations they conquered, first of all. There was the Lydians in Turkey. Then there was the Babylonians they conquered. And finally, Egypt. Three powers, great powers that the Medes and the Persians conquered. The four-headed leopard comes up out of the water next. This, of course, represents ancient Greece. Now, of course, it has six wings. Now, the great leader of the united Greek empire, the first king of the great Greek Empire was Alexander the Great. The reason for the six wings, wings represent speed. It's flying very rapidly. Alexander the Great conquered the Mediterranean Middle Eastern world very rapidly. By the age of about 32, he had conquered all of that region. The four heads represent the four divisions of Greece. When Alexander the Great died, Greece was divided among the four generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy and Seleucus, they divided the Greek empire among themselves. Then came the beast with iron teeth and ten horns. This was the power that conquered the Greeks, ancient Rome. But Daniel was particularly interested in this chapter in the ten horns on the head of the fourth beast. It was among the ten horns and one in particular that drew most of his attention. He was told the ten horns are ten kings who shall rise from this kingdom. And then you remember when we saw that great image of the four metals, golden head, silver chest and arms, belly and thighs of brass. We noticed the feet were iron and clay. These represented the breakup of the Roman Empire. And on this fourth beast, we see now ten horns, like ten toes, ten horns on this beast, the breakup of the Roman, western part of the Roman Empire, which eventually became Europe, we noticed in a previous program. But he noticed particularly among the ten horns, another little one began to come up. This receives most of Daniel's attention. What is this little horn? Well, let's notice what he says about it. I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one, 
coming up among, among the ten, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. So as this one comes up, three go down. And there in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous or boastful words. He shall speak pompous words against the most high. So you notice this little horn is against the most high. Now, who is the most high in the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel? We're left in no doubt. We notice in Daniel 7, we see the Son of Man. The Son of Man comes in to this great vision of Daniel. Let's read what he says. I was watching in the night seasons, visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, then to him, to the Son of Man, was given dominion or a kingdom and glory and a kingdom, so that all peoples, nations and languages should serve or worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Did you notice it? The Son of Man has an eternal kingdom and everyone serves or worship him. That's what we're told. But the Son of Man is actually also called the Most High in this same chapter. Let me show you. The Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So what is said of the Son of Man is said of the Most High. The same things apply to them. So the Son of Man is the Most High in Daniel chapter 7. Given a kingdom, everybody serves, Son of Man. Most High, everybody serves, given a kingdom. So the same being, just called two different names. The Son of Man, of course, in the New Testament was the favourite term that Jesus took. Now, Jesus Christ, when he took this term, wasn't just referring to the fact that he was a human God in human flesh, born like us, so Son of Man. He's referring to the fact that he is the Son of Man of Daniel. Forty times, over 40 times it mentions that, it's a favourite term. So he's the son of man. So what do we go back to now, Daniel 7? This little horn is against the most high. Who's the most high in this chapter? The son of man. Who's the son of man? Christ. Against Christ, which makes him anti-Christ. And that's why in the New Testament, when they're talking about the Antichrist, John and Paul and so on, they're referring to Daniel's chapter 7, where this being, this little horn, who's opposed to the Son of Man, is the Antichrist. That's why we call him that. So who or what, however, is the Antichrist? We can see the little horn is the Antichrist, but who's that? Let's go to university history now of Christianity. We're going to take a quick tour of Christian history, we could call it Christian History 101, if you like, just briefly. Remember, Christianity in the first century began in Jerusalem with Jesus Christ. Crucified, rose from the dead, went back to heaven. Christianity spread from Jerusalem. Quickly, it went to Antioch in Syria. Up to Turkey, Paul took it. Across to Greece, also Paul took it. And finally, it was planted right in the heart of the Roman Empire, Rome itself, the great city of the Romans. Then, of course, we recall in a previous program that in 70 AD, Rome destroyed Jerusalem. The temple was destroyed. Now, with the destruction of Jerusalem and everybody being scattered, Christianity no longer has its centre in Jerusalem. It moves from Jerusalem with its destruction now to Rome very quickly. Rome becomes the centre or the main point, the focal point of Christianity. But recall that Rome is pagan and Christianity in Rome 
where its headquarters now is, becomes increasingly influenced by the pagan Romans around them. We notice that very clearly. But let's come to that in a moment. Let's just pause and notice what happens here at this interesting bridge. You can visit the Milvian Bridge in Rome today, a very old bridge. 313 AD, a very important battle took place right here in Rome. Two great armies were about to fight each other, the forces of Constantine against Maxentius, both vying to be the emperor of Rome. The night before the battle, Constantine tells us that he had a vision where he saw a cross in the sky and he was told, by this sign you shall conquer. So when he woke up, he told his soldiers to paint this on their standards and their flags, their banners, the cross. And the next day when he went to war against Maxentius at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, he won the battle. And so he said, right, I'm in favour of Christianity. Now, actually, it really was a ploy of Constantine. You see, Christianity was getting stronger and stronger throughout the Roman Empire. And Constantine was in, uh, was for, had foresight enough to see that Christianity was going to overtake the Roman Empire and so he said, if you can't beat them, let's join them. So in actual fact, this was actually a ploy of saying why I'm letting Christianity become the official religion of the Roman Empire because he uses this vision of his uh, to say why he's doing what he's doing because Christianity has helped him. So Constantine accepts Christianity. In fact, Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire by the year 324 AD. It is in the ascendancy now in the Roman Empire. So Rome becomes Christian in name, but pagan Roman beliefs now flooded into the Christian church. And uh, Christianity becomes pagan or Roman, if we could put it that way, sadly. In fact, this is what history shows us very clearly. Let's notice this statement from historians. The new Christians, that is under Constantine, the new Christians were, as far as thinking and habits went, the same old pagans. Their surge into the church did not wipe out paganism. On the contrary, hordes of baptised pagans meant that paganism had diluted the moral energies of organised Christianity to the point of impotence. So sadly, the influence of paganism meant Christianity was much weaker now. Now let's continue our history. You recall that in the western part of the Roman Empire, the barbaric tribes began to attack the Roman Empire. And Western Roman Empire collapses between 351 and 476 AD. The emperors move from Rome to Constantinople or Istanbul as we call it today. The first emperor to do that was Constantine himself. He moved his headquarters to Rome. He could see the writing on the wall, so to speak. Now, eventually all of the former Western Roman Empire becomes Christian in name. But there were different forms of Christianity. The Bishop of Rome, living right here in Italy, what we would call Italy today, he believed pretty much what the Bible says, and that is that Jesus always was. He never had a beginning. He always was God from eternity. But there were some other Christians in this parts here, three especially, the Vandals, the Heruli and the Ostrogoths, these groups that actually invaded the Roman Empire, these three groups had a different brand of belief in Jesus. They said, no, Jesus never always existed. The Father once made him way, way, way back in, in eternity somewhere, way back before the creation of this world. They said, Jesus or the word became, it was made, and then he became a human being later on. But he never always existed. Now, in those days, oftentimes, when it came to differences in belief systems, you fought with the sword. And uh, so these three 
powers, the Vandals, the Heruli and the Ostrogoths, the Christian people in those, they fought against the bishops. They gave them a hard time. So the bishops, they asked for help. They, um, uh, these three powers, the Heruli, the Vandals and the Ostrogoths, because of their at attitude in attacking the bishops of Rome, the bishops asked the emperors living in Turkey for some help. Send some armies. We need your help to put these powers down. And over a course of as many years, these three groups were wiped out, completely destroyed. By the year 538 AD, uh, it was really pretty much all over. And now the Emperor Justinian's decree was able to go into practice. And what was his decree? He made the Bishop of Rome both the political and the religious leader of the old western part of the Roman Empire. So now the bishops of Rome, by 538 AD, they are not just religious leaders, they are really political leaders as well. And so the bishops of Rome ruled now for the next 1260 years in European history. Well, that's a quick flyover from the time of Jesus down to the end of the 1260 years. We call this church the medieval church of the dark ages. You've probably heard that's a university term for the Christian church during the medieval period. Now the little horn of Daniel is actually that medieval church. Now what we're going to do now is we're going to let Daniel show us that. We want to let the Bible speak. So let's see what the Bible says that makes it very clear for us that that indeed is what or who the little horn is, the medieval church of the dark ages. Now we're not talking about a person here. We're talking about an institution, a system if you would, not an individual. Now Daniel gives us very clear identifying characteristics. The first one is this, this little horn or the medieval Dark Age Church, it comes from among the ten horns of Western Europe. You remember, it says, a little horn coming up among the ten horns. Now, of course, that's exactly what happened. The medieval Church of Rome, it comes from among the breakup of the old Western Roman Empire, exactly as the Bible said. Number two, it would come after the ten horns or Western Europe has begun. Notice what the Bible says. And it had ten horns. I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. Now remember the ten horns of Western Europe, the breakup of the old western part of the Roman Empire was done by 476 AD but when does the medieval church of Rome begin it begins in the year 538 AD when the Emperor Justinian's decree can go into practice number three the medieval church replaced three of the ten horns the Bible says before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. Now remember, we saw it. These three powers, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli and the Vandals were completely wiped out by the year 538 AD. The Bishop of Rome takes their place. We saw that very clearly as we travel through Europe. It's amazing, my friend, tonight to think that Daniel predicted all this 500 BC, 2,500 years ago. It's uncanny but he made it very specific that three horns would be plucked up by the roots and they were and replaced by the medieval dark age church. Number four, sadly, Daniel saw that this power would persecute God's people. Notice what he says. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, just like Daniel in his John in the Revelation said, Daniel says the same thing. Now, one of the saddest things in European history or church history was the persecution, sadly, that the church 
did actually uh, do. Let's notice from the church's paper itself, the Western Watchman, the church has persecuted only a tyro, that's somebody who doesn't know their history, or a novice in his church history will deny that. When she thinks it good to use physical force, she will use it. Why did this happen? Well, it was because there were faithful, godly priests and bishops in the Christian church who could see that the church was straying from the Bible, that they were not following the scriptures, that paganism had crept into the church as we saw during the time of Constantine and after that. So they called the church back to the Bible, calling people to come back to the word of God. But sadly, the church leaders and church people would not listen. And to silence their voices, they killed them, beheaded them, um, burnt them. Many terrible things were done. And that's what the church is saying. Uh, she has done these sorts of things. Number five. She would persecute for 1260 years. Daniel saw this. Then the saints, God's friends, shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Now you say, how do you get 1260 years out of a time, time and half a time? Very easy, my friend, if we let the Bible interpret itself. So let's do that. When we go to the book of Revelation, and by the way, these two books are like a hand in a glove. Daniel and Revelation go together. That's why Jesus said, study the book of Daniel when he gave the signs of the end. There was Jesus who gave the book of Revelation, the whole book. These two books are very important for our day. In the book of Revelation, John sees a woman. We noticed this woman in a previous program. The dragon chases after her into the wilderness. Notice what the Bible says. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Now in the same chapter, talking about the same period where the woman is chased into the desert, he uses a different time way to express that time. Notice what it says. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So you notice that? Time, times and half that the woman is in the wilderness is 1,260 years because she's in the wilderness for 1,260 days, I should say. Exactly. So Daniel, we know what time, times and a half is. It's 1,260 days. But remember, as we've seen in previous programs, in prophecy, one prophetic day represents one literal year. And we've seen that from the prophet Ezekiel, who lived at the same time as Daniel. I have laid on you a day for each year, in prophecy that is. So, in 538 AD, the Emperor Justinian added political power to the Bishop of Rome's religious authority we saw. That went into effect in 538 AD. If we add 1260 years to that, we will come to the year 1798. So what happened in 1798? Enter Napoleon Bonaparte. The French Revolution has been had. Napoleon has emerged out of the French Revolution as the number one leader coming out of that. And he marches down, his soldiers march down, one of his generals, to the Vatican, General Berthier, and he takes the Pope prisoner in 1798, exactly on time. As the Bible predicted, that's what happened. Pope Pius was exiled right here in Valence in France, Pope Pius VI. And uh, this was an incredible event in European history. Number six, this power would try to change God's commandments. Daniel says, he shall intend to change the times and the law. And he's been talking about the most high times and laws. Now I want to share with you something that is quite disturbing for some people right now. Here is a catechism of the church. Now, a catechism is a book to instruct people in the faith, 
for, so that they can become baptized and be part of the church. You will notice the catechism is set out here on the right and what you see in the Bible. It's looking at the Ten Commandments. In the Bible, the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods. It's the same as in the catechism. But the second commandment says, you shall not make a graven image and bow down to it and worship it. But the uh, second commandment in the catechism says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. But that's actually the third commandment in the Bible. So in actual fact, what has happened is the second commandment in the catechism is not there. It's been taken out so that number two commandment is really the third commandment. When we come to the fourth commandment in the Bible, it's very long. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Which day is the Sabbath? The seventh day gives us a lot of details. But when you go to the catechism, it's just abbreviated. Remember the Sabbath day. Doesn't tell you which day is the Sabbath day. Just says, remember the Sabbath day. So that's drastically changed. How do you then do you get Ten Commandments? Because everybody knows there are Ten Commandments. Well, in the Bible, the Tenth Commandment says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his manservant, or his maidservant, or anything. But in the Catechism, that one is split into two. Ninth Commandment is, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and the Tenth one is, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. Now, to... Anybody who doesn't really know, it looks like there are 10 commandments, but in actual fact, one is gone. The second commandment is removed out of the catechism for very obvious reasons, because when you visit many churches, people are bowing down to statues and so on. And so this is what has happened. Now I want to bring you to perhaps the greatest indicator of the identifying character and that characteristics that Daniel gives and that's when history um, history's greatest counterfeit when actual fact history wasn't his story wasn't God's story you've probably heard of the cow path or the calf path maybe you have maybe you haven't let me share with you quickly one day a calf wanders into the forest and he walks this way and that way through this very big forest and comes out miles away on the other side of the forest. The next day, a dog with a man on his horse, they come and go down the track of that the calf has left and wander through on the same path out of the forest. A few days later, a man comes along. He's got a bullock cart and he follows this little bit of a track and it becomes a bit wider thanks to him as he winds his way with his bullet cart through this forest and this track that's been made. Eventually, this becomes a road. Years later, it becomes a super highway where people come and they wonder, why do we go this way and that way through this forest? Why are we twisting and turning? Nobody knew it was all because of a calf some three or 400 centuries before that had taken a wander one day. But everybody had simply followed the calf path. Well, I want to talk to you about a real calf path, so to speak, and that is how the Sabbath changed from Saturday to Sunday. In our last program, we saw very clearly that the seventh day, the Saturday, is the Sabbath of the Bible, the seventh day Sabbath. And there should have been a question in our minds, and I'm sure there was for many of you, then why do we worship on the first day or the Sunday? in most countries, the first day. How come not the seventh day, the Sabbath? How did the change come about? Well, the book of Daniel spells it out for us in this same chapter. Notice what he says. He, that's this little horn or antichrist, he shall speak great words against the Most High and wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change the times and the laws. Notice the times and the laws. There's only one commandment or one law of God that deals with time, and that's the Sabbath. The Sabbath is God's law concerning time. When to meet each seventh day, we remember, we saw. And so Daniel, 2,500 years ago, is predicting 
the attempt to change the Sabbath that would take place down through history. That's amazing when you stop and think about it, my friend. Daniel was shown by God that this change would be attempted. So how did they change it from Saturday to Sunday or the seventh day to the first day? Well, let me share with you what university history, Christian history tells us. You can see this in history books. Number one, the change was gradual, first of all. It didn't happen overnight. It took place very slowly. The first thing we notice in this story of how Saturday, Sabbath changed from Saturday to Sunday is this. The first century church was keeping the seventh day or the Saturday Sabbath. We see that very clearly. For example, Jesus on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city of Jerusalem, he tells the apostles to keep the seventh day Sabbath 40 years into the future. You see, he says, pray that your flight may not be in the winter on the Sabbath. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Pray that you don't have to escape on the Sabbath or the winter. Why not the winter? Well, it's cold in the winter. It snows in that part of the world in winter many times why not the sabbath well they would miss all the tremendous blessings of connecting with god as they run for their life they're looking after which they need to do but they're going to miss the blessings jesus says pray that you don't even have to miss one sabbath in that special sense with god when we come to turkey paul came here to antioch i love people bringing people here to Ister, to turkey to antioch you can walk up the very streets that no doubt Paul came through with the shops on the side here. Then you will come to the great um, temple of Augustus right up toward the end. But among the ruins of old Antioch, there is St. Paul's church. One or two churches here in this place. Because Paul preached the gospel here and Christianity began, began here in the city of Antioch. Notice what happens when Paul came. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, if Paul had have known of a change from Sabbath to Sunday, he would have said, no, don't come next Sabbath. Come tomorrow morning. It's the Sunday. It's the first day of the week. Lord, the Lord's changed the day from Saturday to Sunday, if there had been a change. But he didn't say anything because the Lord hadn't changed it, of course. I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. So Paul said, yeah, come next Sabbath. And what happened next Sabbath? On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. They came to church, in other words, to hear God's word spoken to them. When we come to the city of Thessalonica, Paul came here, Notice what he did when he came to the city of Thessalonica, a marvellous place to visit. I love plaking people through the ruins of old Thessalonica where Paul came here. Notice what he says. It says, They came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom or habit was, he went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. So Paul's custom was to go and share on the Sabbath. Why didn't he do it for four Sabbaths? Because they ran him out of town before number four came up. He was chased out of Thessalonica. In fact, when you read from Genesis to Revelation, you will always find that Saturday or the seventh day is the Sabbath. God is the first Sabbath keeper. In the Garden of Eden, he keeps the Sabbath with Adam and Eve. Moses has given the Sabbath commandment to write down on stone on, the ten, on Mount Sinai. The, the prophets of the Old Testament are Sabbath keepers. You see that in the book of Ezekiel, Isaiah. Jesus is a Sabbath keeper. Paul is a Sabbath keeper. John is a Sabbath keeper on Patmos. Let me tell you, my friend, when you keep the Sabbath, you're in good company right from Genesis to Revelation. But the second thing that happened was this. Saturday and Sunday were observed from the 2nd and the 5th centuries AD. So we start off with the 7th day Sabbath. The next thing is from the 2nd century, after the Bible's been finished, 
we're into the second century because it finishes in the first century. Second century, the fifth, now they start to keep two days. Let's notice what history says. Sozman's Ecclesiastical History. The people of Constantinople and almost everywhere assemble together on the Sabbath as well as on the first day of the week, which custom is never observed at Rome or at Alexandria. Let's notice another statement. Almost all the churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries, that's the Lord's Supper or the Communion or Eucharist, on the Sabbath of every week. Yet the Christians of Alexandria and at Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, have ceased to do this. So it's only at Alexandria and Rome that they're not keeping the two days now. But everyone else is now keeping two days, Sabbath and the first day of the week. Thirdly, pagan sun worship led the church in Rome to change from Sabbath to Sunday. It was the influence of paganism in the old Roman city, the Roman Empire there in Rome, that led them to choose Sunday and replace Saturday with Sunday. Why is that? Why didn't they choose Tuesday or Wednesday or Friday? How come Sunday? For very good reasons. Let's go to the Church of St. Clemente. I like to bring people to this church because the archaeologists have been excavating underneath this church and they discovered down here, <coughs> pardon me, a Mithraic altar for sun worship. You see, the pagan Romans worshipped the sun god. They worshipped on sun's day, the first day of the week, the venerable day of the sun. And Mithraism was a, a, one of the forms of sun worship. And it was practiced in the Roman Empire, sun worship. In fact, ancient sun worship was practiced right across the Mediterranean region in many different times. Because the sun is, seems to be uh, so important to us as human beings, of course. Notice what the encyclopedia tells us. Sabbath, which is a Hebrew word signifying rest, which is what Sabbath means. Sunday was a name given by the heathens to the first day of the week because it was the day on which they worshipped the sun. That's just general knowledge, general history. But notice what the church says also. The sun was a foremost god with heathendom. There is in truth something royal, something kingly about the sun. Warms us up, you know. Making it a fit emblem, says the church of Jesus, the son of justice. Hence the church in these countries would seem to have said, keep that old pagan name, Sunday, it shall remain consecrated or sanctified and thus the pagan Sunday which was dedicated to Balder the sun god became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus in other words it would seem that Christians said let's take the sun's day that our pagan friends keep and let's use that day but not so much for the s-u-n but for the s-o-n in honor of Jesus taking a pagan practice and giving it Christian trappings. This was a sad thing because they took the Sabbath away to do that in Rome as we saw. Number four, the government laws were made encouraging Sunday worship. Constantine was the first one. Notice what it says, 321 AD, on the venerable day of the sun, sun's day, the first day of the week, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest and let all the shops be closed. Now the fifth one was that the church forbade Sabbath worship next, the final point. This is what the Christian church said at one of its councils. Christians shall not Judaize, that is, they shall not keep the Sabbath and be idle on Saturday. But the Lord's Day, which they now call Sunday, but in the Bible we saw it's the Sabbath day. John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and the Lord's Day is called the Sabbath, we notice. But the Lord's Day they shall especially honour, and as being Christians shall, if possible, do no work on that day. If, however, they are found Judaising, they shall be shut out from Christ. Now, did you notice that, my friends? 
Here we have God is a Sabbath keeper. All the Old Testament prophets and people were Sabbath keepers, God's people. Jesus was a Sabbath keeper. Peter, Paul, John in the Revelation, all these were Sabbath keepers. And now sadly the Christian church is saying if you keep Sabbath, you're shut out from Christ. You see what happens, my friend. It's one of the saddest things. When we move away from this Bible, we end up calling truth error and error truth. They're now calling the Sabbath that God himself kept and called man to make. They're now calling that people will be shut out from Christ for keeping that which he himself called men to keep. This was indeed a sad moment. Now let's notice what the church's catechism actually says about the Sabbath. It's in the form of questions and answer. And so we pick up the first question. Which is the Sabbath day? Answer given, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Well then the question is next, why then do we observe Sunday instead of Sabbath if the Bible says Saturday? How come? Answer, because the church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. The church is very open. They, they believe they have the authority to do that, to transfer the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. I want you to bring you to a statement by a cardinal in the Church of Rome, Cardinal James Gibbon. This man very honestly spells it out for us. Let's notice what he says. You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday. That's very clear, as we've already seen from the Bible. The bishop, the cardinal, is quite right. What do other churches say about this issue? Well, let's notice what the Anglican Church says people in the Anglican church. And where are we told in the scriptures that we are to keep the first day at all? We are commanded to keep the seventh, but we are nowhere commanded to keep the first day. The reason why we keep the first day of the week holy instead of the seventh is for the same reason that we observe many other things. Not because the Bible, but because the church has enjoined it. So we do it not because of what the Bible says, but because the church says it. This is very plain. You see that other Christians acknowledge this, that the Bible Sabbath is Sabbath, Saturday. Now, here's the question. Why would Satan want to change the Sabbath from the, first, the seventh day to the first day, or usually the Saturday to the Sunday in most places, the seventh day to the first day? Why would he want to do that? Well, remember, behind all of this is Satan, who is the ultimate antichrist. He hates Christ. He's, he's, he's fought Christ for centuries, even in the wilderness. Just worship me, he said to Jesus Christ, you'll recall. He hates Jesus Christ. And the Sabbath reminds us, number one, that Jesus is Lord God Almighty. He's Jehovah just as the Father is. He prayed to his Father, Jehovah. The Holy Spirit is God Almighty. So is Jesus. Thomas worshipped him and Jesus acknowledged his worship of him. You should only worship God, the Bible says. Yet people worship Jesus and he accepted worship because he's God. The Sabbath reminds us that Jesus is Lord God Almighty because it says, remember the Sabbath of the Lord God, it says. And Jesus said he's Lord of the Sabbath. Let's pick it up. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, the Bible says, the fourth commandment. And Jesus said, the Son of Man is Lord. I am that Lord. I am that almighty God. The Sabbath, so the devil does not want us to think who Jesus is like that. Secondly, of course, the Sabbath reminds us that Jesus as Lord God Almighty is our creator. He brought us into existence. Our roots go back to him. We were made in his image. The devil wants to take that away from us, that idea. Jesus is not only our creator, he's our provider. 
He looks after all our needs, we saw last program. And finally, he's our redeemer. Those same hands that fashioned the world, that made it in six days, those same hands were nailed to a cross. He stretched them out for you and me. That's why the devil wants to take away the Sabbath, because if he can remove the Sabbath, he can remove the reminder of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and what Jesus is doing. And he's done it very well. Because sadly today, most Christians even do not believe in a creation in six days by Jesus. We've forgotten the Sabbath. Now we've even forgotten the Creator. And he has done this, this being because sadly the church forgot to remember. And sadly, what happens when we forget to remember who Jesus is through his Sabbath? Jesus gives us rest. Come unto me, he said. On the Sabbath, he said these words, Come to me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Are you burdened this evening with worries and anxieties? Are you burdened with your sin? You can always come to Jesus. He is the Lord of the Sabbath, and he gives us release. That's why Peter said, Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. This is the reasons the devil has changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday so he can destroy our memory of who is behind the Sabbath, the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus himself. You see, Jesus, your creator, the Lord God Almighty, was sent by the Father, the Lord God Almighty, to die so that he would take our place, our sin, our death. So the question tonight as we close is, who will you and I follow? Will we follow the calf path that everybody has been on for centuries, not realizing where this thing began? Will we continue on that path? Who will, we, will be our guide? Will it be the traditions of men or will it be the Bible? Which one will be, will we follow? Man's traditions or God's words? Who will we follow? Will we follow Christ or will we follow church leaders in this thing? We must follow Jesus Christ. Someone says tonight, does it really matter? Is it, that, is it really that big a deal? Isn't it just one day as opposed to another? My friend, the Bible is very clear. It matters to God. And if it matters to God, if it matters to Jesus, it should matter to us. It must matter to us. In fact, Jesus said these words, in vain, that means uselessly, worthlessly, waste of time if you would. In vain they worship me. Why are they worshipping uselessly? Because he says, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. You see, Jesus is saying people, push, people bring up man's traditions and push away God's commandments, but they worship according to man's traditions. And that's exactly what's happened with the Sabbath we've seen. Men have come up with an idea, a teaching which has become a tradition, but it's replaced what God has said, his commandments. And that's what Jesus was getting at. Now, what does God expect me to do? You may say tonight, well, I didn't understand this. And granted, many people have not known this. Your parents probably never knew about this. Your grandparents, because it's been lost sight of for centuries. So what should we do? What does God expect of us? Well, first of all, God does not judge us on what we don't know, but on what we do with what we do know that's right. Paul mentions this. He's speaking on Mars Hill in Athens. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world. So at times of ignorance God overlooks. But once we come to know the truth on any subject, on this one at the moment, Sabbath, we must follow what God says because he's going to judge the world one day. And he'll judge us not on what we don't know, but on what we do with what we do know. 
So who will you and I worship? I believe your decision is that of the Apostle Peter. You want to be like him. Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And that's the best place to be tonight on this issue. Martin Luther took a stand on the Bible. He wanted to follow the truth of the word of God. He was a godly priest in the church of Rome, loved God. But because he was teaching the things of the Bible, he came in trouble with the church because it had strayed from the Bible. He eventually was taken by the church to a very big council at Worms in Germany and he was told to give up his beliefs and to follow what the church said. I want you to notice the stand that Luther took back there in the 1500s in Germany. I am bound by the scriptures, the Bible, that I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. My friend tonight, I believe you want to take your stand on the word of God. It's the only place, safe place to stand. Not to follow the traditions of men, but follow Jesus and his commandments. I'm sure tonight you want to make that decision. I'm going to get you to go down underneath the screen right now. Go to the card. It says card there. And we're going to fill out the card. But before we do that, I want to pray together and ask God to help us as we fill out this card tonight. Let's just bow together in prayer. Father, tonight, as we're sitting in our homes, wherever we are, help us to respond to the Spirit of God who's speaking to us right now. Help us not to put things off because of our friends or the opinions of people in the church that we may know or whatever it is. May we follow God and his word tonight. Help us as we fill out this card. Give us the courage of our convictions. Help us to be like Martin Luther, to stand on the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's go to the... Um, First question tonight, down under the screen, click on card and we go to the bottom. First of all, number two, number two, I accept Jesus as my saviour and desire to obey him fully. Remember number one we had earlier, that was the one here, I'd like a copy of the book Messiah. If you'd like a copy of that book, then circle number one. But number two, I accept Jesus as my saviour. And I desire to obey him fully. If you've not yet accepted Jesus, won't you make that decision tonight? Circle number two. Number three, following tonight's topic, if this is what you want, tick this one. It's clear the seventh day Bible Sabbath, Saturday is the true Lord's day. If it's clear that the seventh day, or what we call Saturday in Australia, is the true Lord's day, if that's clear, then tick box number two tonight. Three, I should say. Number four, I love Jesus and I want to keep his seventh day Sabbath holy. If you'd like to tell the Lord tonight, Lord, I'm going to start to keep your seventh day Sabbath holy. By the way, <laughs> Sabbath's already started now, hasn't it? Sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, that's the Lord's Sabbath. And so happy Sabbath to you tonight. This is God's time, special day. If you'd like to... Keep the Lord's seventh day Sabbath holy. Won't you click box number four? Make sure you put your name and your address, contact details and uh, your email so we can send you a summary of tonight's program. You notice right at the bottom it says, I'd like a summary of tonight's program. Click on that one and we'll send that to you and we'll also get you the book. Make sure you leave us your details so we can get that book Messiah to you. You'll love that book on the life of Jesus and you will, I'm sure, want to get a copy of tonight's program. Well, we're glad you were with us tonight. Invite a friend to join you on your link. Send them a copy of the link because we're moving into some amazing topics. Tomorrow night, Egypt, Babylon and the Book of the Dead. Justice demands a verdict. What an amazing program this is going to be 
as we go to the program tomorrow evening, Egypt and the Book of the Dead. You'll love that. Seven o'clock tomorrow night. Then on Friday week, Friday week, Countdown Eternity, Ancient Mystery Revealed. This is an amazing program. We're going to go to the most the, the Bible's longest time prophecy, and you are going to see we are on the knife edge of eternity. People are anxious about coronavirus. Let me tell you, the Bible shows you we're in that time of the end right now. Coronavirus, one of the pestilences was, were signs Jesus gave of the end of time, but he gave even more specific signs than that. He showed us incredible prophecies which show us we're now in the time in which the end will take place. We don't know when Jesus will come, but we have this incredible prophecy. Don't miss it next Friday week. May God bless you. Look after yourself. Make sure you get good exercise, fresh air, drink plenty of water, stay healthy. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow night as we go to Egypt and Babylon. God bless you.